guys. I'm here with Jason Rizza Giorgiani. And um, yeah, he's an author and a super amazing intellectual guy, and he does a bunch of lectures. So I'm here to talk. Okay, we could talk about a million things, but the primary thing I'm going to talk about today with him is the breakaway civilization. So hello, Jason. Hi, Nikki. It's great to be with you. Thanks. Okay, so when did you first get into, okay, maybe let's paraphrase for the audience what you mean by breakaway civilization, and then tell me how you got into that. Sure. So the idea of a breakaway civilization is the idea that um, an elite from amongst uh, one or more human societies has separated itself from uh, the public industry and economy, and um, either on some uh, island somewhere or in some subterranean facilities or all of the above, they've developed a civilization that has bifurcated from uh, the various known civilizations of the earth. And so it's the idea that uh, these people have been able to develop an autonomous industry and economy to the point where their culture has fundamentally diverged from the uh, extant human cultures of the earth. And their world is legitimately describable as a civilization unto itself. This is actually a very old idea. It's an idea that you see in uh, Sir Francis Bacon's The New Atlantis, going back to the 1600s, Thomas More's Utopia. Uh, and you know, it's an idea that uh, is at the core of Ayn Rand's famous uh, novel, Atlas Shrugged. I mean, John Galt basically um, has absconded to some, uh, well, a remote location where he's attempting to set up a breakaway civilization by harvesting all of the great geniuses of the planet. Um, and so that's one of the most popular, I think, presentations of the idea. Uh, but you also had a rather bizarre documentary style film made in the 1970s, I think, on British television called Alternative 3, where the scenario was that a group of scientists had come to the conclusion that the Earth was going to face uh, imminent ecological catastrophe. And so they started to colonize Mars secretly in some joint collaboration between the United States and the Soviet Union. And uh, the media uh, becomes aware of this through the disappearances of numerous uh, high-level scientists in various fields. And it turns out that they're basically being transplanted to this breakaway civilization. So it's an idea that's, that's very old. It's been floating around. Uh, it's been presented in literature and in film. And I ultimately um, came to the realization through decades of, of study uh, of the close encounter phenomenon that a significant component of this phenomenon is the idea of a breakaway civilization. Yeah. Um, okay. So for me, I came to it more from the, which I also am into the UFO encounter stuff too, but for me, I came for it more through looking at like megaliths, you know, and kind of going like, hmm, I don't, I, I, I kind of feel like they didn't have, I, I, if there, there has to be, like when I went to Saxe Woman in Peru and I saw like the stones, I was like, mm, these people didn't just die off. Like they're somewhere. Like, I, I don't know why I think that, but that's what that started getting me into just naturally looking up like, uh, where would a civilization live if it still was alive, but it was like hidden from society. And so then like, I kind of like back reverse engineered into like breakaway civilizations. And then I, I heard about Richard Dolan and Joseph Farrell and um, yeah, so was, and then I got into like, yeah, what do you think about the, uh, not, not, what is it like, not hollow earth, but um, you know, we're inner earth where yeah. they, like, yeah, they live underneath the earth kind of thing. What do you think about that? Sure. So um, let me back up one step and, and say, you know, full disclosure, actually uh, a lot of what you're saying about these enigmatic megaliths factored into my interest in the breakaway civilization and to my being able to connect that concept to the close encounter phenomenon. Because I've also been intrigued for decades uh, with you know, the, the structures in um, South America, Tiwanaku, Teotihuacan, and 
the similarities between the oldest strata of architecture in those places uh, and, and uh, you know, the oldest buildings that we find in Egypt, like for example, the, um, the Osirian at Abydos uh, and Tiwanaku share this incredibly austere, anonymous, high precision uh, megalithic design, which was overlaid by the native cultures of those areas with motifs that are particular to their world of meaning. But when you strip those away and you go to the oldest strata of these structures that you know, we can geologically date to uh, you know, vast antiquity, you see that the style is almost futuristic. It's, it's a style that's, it's almost like you're looking at brutalist architecture, uh, almost as if it's modern in some sense. And so you know, I, I was really intrigued by that. And I came very much to the same conclusion that you did, that you know, these people, for some reason, went underground um, or underwater, perhaps, that the, the Atlantean civilization was not entirely destroyed. It became a, an occulted civilization. And probably a lot of the machinations of various secret societies on this planet can ultimately be traced back to the survivors of this uh, antediluvian world. Uh, so, so then to answer your question about what do I think about the idea of the inner earth and so forth, I mean, I don't think that the earth is hollow, but there are vast caverns, uh, you know, in the continental shelves, um, inside of mountains. I mean, you know, in the American Southwest, as, as you know, you know better than I do, uh, there's a vast network of, you know, gigantic caverns that stretches across like three or four states. Um, you know, around Arizona, New Mexico, and, and that whole area. Yeah, I was just, I was just at this one called um, the Cave Without a Name, and it's, as far as they know, it's at least 50 miles, but that's only what they've explored, and they only have what's open for the public, like half a mile. You know, I mean, there's stuff like that all over the Southwest. Yeah, I've been to, you know, a small portion of, of that uh, cavern system, and it's easy to see how you could set up an entire subterranean civilization on this planet, uh, especially if you, know, you were able to build structures into the continental shelves. Um, and then not to, to get too far ahead of ourselves, but it's a, it's a well-known fact to anyone who studied the close encounter phenomenon at any depth that at least 50% of the UFO sightings are sightings of craft seen entering and exiting the oceans. And 70% of this planet is ocean. Yeah. And also UFOs don't seem to have a problem going in and out of water. They don't seem to lose speed or, uh, you know, the, it's not really a good thing for them. Yeah, so it's because they have a local gravitational field that creates an envelope around the craft. Mm. So, okay, here's where uh, I, I've noticed a lot of the UFO people think that the breakaway civilization is just Nazi, which I think Nazis play into it. But I, and maybe they're the most modern rendition of it, but I, like, I, I'm sort of going more with the uh, Atlantean, like, it, it's older than 70 years I, uh, from, from my perspective. So how do you uh, marry those sure. two? Sure. Well, this is one case where I'm not going to tell you the bottom line up front, because, like, uh, <laughs> this is something that needs to be laid out very carefully. Because right, the, conclusion that, the conclusion that I've come to is so... Um, mind-boggling and disturbing that you know i think people need to be slowly prepared to to wrap their minds around it okay let me start saying that i agree with you entirely that this this phenomenon uh, has been um of the breakaway civilization has been misunderstood as exclusively nazi or or, or exclusively connected to the third reich and that's uh largely because people don't understand what the third reich was so we need to go back to uh, the late 1800s and particularly to the airship mystery of 1896-97, where you had sightings, uh, especially in Texas. Aurora, but, Aurora that's right. I've been there. You had, you had all these sightings of airships in Texas and in at least 10 other states, at least, uh, particularly the Western states and parts of the Midwest of these giant airships, I mean, they were between 100 and 200 meters in length. 
These were not blimps full of gas or something. No, no, no. These were like Jules Verne style contraptions. And they were witnessed by so many people that I think there were hundreds of newspaper reports in about 40 different states. Uh, they were witnessed by uh, respectable, prominent members of society, judges, sheriffs, and so forth. And these airships would land and people would come out of them, not aliens, people would come out of them and they would, especially on farms, they'd land on farms and they'd ask to be resupplied. Could they have water from the well, you know, restock their food uh, supplies? In one case, interestingly, a case of a guy called Alexander Hamilton, it appears that they actually uh, grappled one of his cattle and took it away with them. So this is sort of like the beginning of the cattle. Cow like, mutilation, yeah. Phenomenon, right? But generally, they weren't that impolite. They would land and, you know, in a very gentlemanly fashion, ask to be resupplied. And when queried about who they are and where these airships were coming from, they said, and this is from a number of different accounts synthesized together, accounts that overlap, they said that they were uh, built in Iowa. These airships were, there were five of them. They were built in Iowa and it was funded by financiers from New York. And that the guy, the guy who had designed these was a certain Wilson um, from Goshen, New York. Uh, other people who've done research into this, Walter Bosley and, and um, uh, a guy called R.A. Harbinson have come to the conclusion that his name was Hiram Wilson and he was a New Yorker. And apparently he was an engineer involved in developing these airships. So, okay, here's where the connection to, to Germany, you know, starts to, um, starts to, uh, to be made is that if we wanna look into what project could possibly have produced this kind of advanced technology in the late, late 1800s, one of the keys to, to cracking that are the notebooks of a certain Charles Delschau. He was a Texas German. He was one of these German immigrants to Texas. And he went to work for a group of people in California uh, who in his notebooks, Charles Delschau in his notebooks claims were Prussian nationalists, uh, but they were not representing the, the government of Germany, okay? So in, in Europe at that time, there was no unified Germany. You had all these different uh, German states like Austria, you know, the Austro-Hungarian empire was not part of the Northern part of Germany. And then you had the Swiss Germans and so forth. And so the idea of a unified Germany was just that, it was an idea, it was an ideal. And Delschau claims in his notebooks that he did these technical drawings of uh, airships for this group of Prussian nationalists whose aspiration was not only to create a unified Germany, but to have it colonize the Americas. And that this was a private corporate group that was uh, financing the construction of airships in the Americas for the sake of the colonization uh, and resource mining of the Americas, both North and South. So they were working in California at that time in the 1860s, 70s, when Delshaw was involved with them. And it appears that the 1890s airships were the outcome of that trajectory of research and development. And they were seen extensively through South America as well, in Colombia, in Venezuela, in the 1870s. Uh, and you know, one thing to consider in that respect is where would these, these airships land? I mean, one Texan in, during the 1896-97 flap said that the airship operators who landed on his farm in exchange for resupplying provisions, they offered him a ride to South America and back like in a day, right? So where would they land in South America? Well, it turns out that these Prussians had bought something like 50,000 acres square, you know, 50,000 acres of land in Patagonia, Argentina, mm. where interestingly enough, and we'll get to this later after World War II, you know, uh, fugitive Nazis took refuge. So you had this whole, you know, apparatus um, that was intercontinental between Germany and North and South America already in the 1890s. And the last thing I'll add before I, you know, I want to hear your reflections on that is, uh, that people generally aren't aware how many of the leading industrialists 
and financiers of this country, namely the United States, helped to create the Third Reich. JP Morgan appears to have been the financier behind this airship project in New York. That New York financial firm that the pilots referred to when they were asked about, you know, who was backing this project, that appears to have been JP Morgan. Now, JP Morgan, uh, with his Chase Bank, together with Alan Dulles, who would eventually set up the CIA, and John Rockefeller, these three men, were the principal financiers for the rise of fascism in Europe, not just Nazi Germany, but also Mussolini's Italy. They were uh, the people who were pumping most of the money to back the rise of fascism in Europe into Europe from America through the banking system. And then you had Ford, who was an ardent fascist, who was helping Hitler to build tanks after we were already at war with Germany. And then you had IBM, whose German division, Dehomag, was about a decade in advance of the American IBM in terms of technology, we found out when we went into the ruins of, of Germany in 1945. So IBM is helping them on the front of you know, computer technology. You had all of these top American industrialists and financiers helping the rise of the right, and you had this uh, Prussian corporatist group here trying to develop airship technology to colonize the Americas. So that deeper and broader context has to be considered before concluding that this is some kind of a Nazi project. No, actually, Nazi Germany was like a field laboratory for a kind of intercontinental Anglo-Saxon elite that was interested in the development of, of, of advanced technologies for resource exploitation and other things. Wow. Okay. So is that, where does the, the real society and then the, you know, the, you know, I think it's, it is interesting that you have the, you know, the, the Nazi party really interested in the eugenics of like the blonde hair, blue eyed. And then you have the whole, um, that's like what a lot of the ETs look like anyway. I mean, what, so where does that all come into the, to this? Okay. So step by step, we'll lay, we'll lay that out. But that's the that's the yeah, perfect and, follow up question. Yeah, uh, but I mean, like I do feel like I mean, and then isn't Prescott Bush? He was uh, in Deutsche Bank and some other kind of financing for. Um, I I mean it like the, it it goes on and on the amount oh, of. Um, oh yes. Yeah, it's it's oh, yes. it's insane. Um, yeah, I, I and and the and the South America stuff. It, it's it's interesting because they still have. Um, they still have German towns in Patagonia. Like when I went to Chile, I was like, uh, it, it was really interesting because um, like, that's not just hearsay. Like they, that, that's like very real that they, they escaped down there and that's that, that's what it's at. So yeah. I, I mean, yeah. yeah. So, and the Texas thing though, I, where I've been to is the Aurora, Aurora, Texas had a crash of a, of a craft in 1898, I believe. And then they buried the, they called him the man from space or something like that, or maybe it was Martian. I can't remember, but they gave him a Christian burial. Like they even, it's in the Dallas morning news. Like there's an article about it and it, it, it talks about, it was a flying, um, I, I don't know. They didn't have UFOs then. Like they didn't even have the Wright brothers hadn't even invented the airplane yet. So they called it some kind of flying vessel that had a, a space, I have to get the exact article, but I went to like the grave to try to see if you could could find it. Yeah, it's an unmarked grave, it could be anywhere in there, but it is interesting because that that does line up with, there is a lot of tells around here of people saying that they saw stuff in the 1890s. So um, yeah, that's super cool that you've dug that deep into that. So I need to, I'm gonna look up some of your sources and go, ooh, sweet. Okay, so yeah, um, so let's yeah, get into- so, um, this stuff, the first, just in terms of sources, because if people want to trace a lot of this bibliographically, um, the, in this book, Lovers of Sophia, there's an essay called Black Sunrise. And that has a whole bunch of uh, bibliographical citations to the sources for this type of material. And then I revisited it in Prometheism in the chapter called Atlas Never Shrugs. Uh, so there's a, there's a whole bunch more there. In particular, the stuff about the late 1800s airship phenomenon and this group of uh, Prussian corporatists, that's in that chapter of Prometheism. And then in terms of the Nordics, the tall white Nordics, and how is this connected to this whole idea of the master race and so forth that the SS was promulgating, uh, that's in this novel that I wrote, Faustian Futurist, where 
I talk about George Adamski and his connections to fascism, which hopefully we can get into momentarily. But you asked about Vril, okay? And this is key. So in the late 1800s, Nikola Tesla was uh, attempting to develop a technology that would broadcast electrical power globally in a way that uh, to the consternation of JP Morgan, his financier, could not be metered, okay? So basically an energy system where the energy coming out of it would be greater than the energy being put into it. You need to power the system itself, but you'd get more energy from out of that system than the energy that you put into it, right? But here's the thing about the Wardenclyffe Tower that uh, he did the proof of concept for in Colorado and then he tried to construct in New York, is that technicians have looked at this system and they've said, oh, this would have never worked. You know, he, he didn't really understand what he was doing, et cetera, whatever. It's because Tesla was working with a different physics model altogether. In his high voltage experiments, Tesla had realized that there's a connection between electromagnetism and gravity. And that if you could, uh, if you could manipulate gravity in the right way, you could actually tap power from the ether. There was a uh, physics model in that period of a dynamic ether where, you know, instead of basically seeing uh, atoms and subatomic particles as pieces of matter inside of empty space, you conceive of them as like compound vortices inside a plenum so that there's no empty space. There's a, a seething plenum a fullness of energy, background energy in the cosmos. And then what we think of as subatomic particles are actually like eddies, like whirlpools, compound vorticular structures inside this ether. So he was developing technology uh, based on a different physics model that would allow you to tap the ether. Going back um, into the, to the early 1800s, uh, there were a whole group of occultists centered around Edward Bulwer Lytton, who had written a book called Vril, The Power of the Coming Race, who were already referring to this etheric energy as Vril. So, you know, these Prussian uh, corporatists that I was discussing earlier, who were developing airships in the Americas for the exploitation of resources, especially in South America, they evolved into a group called the Thule Society. It wasn't the Vril Society. It was a group called the Thule Society, which basically is a German translation of the, the Atlantis Society because Thule is Atlantis in Germanic mythology. And this Thule Society was centered on the concept of Vril. These were you know, uh, people who believed in this kind of etheric energy and they were very wealthy. They were barons and lords and you know, uh, aristocrats who were concerned about the spread of communism at that time, um, particularly in Germany, because you know, you know, people forget me, Karl Marx did a lot of his work in, in Britain, but he was a German. And so you know, uh, Germany was a hotbed of communism and these aristocrats were afraid of the spread of communism. So they set up the National Socialist German Workers' Party as a political action committee, basically, as a pack, as a front for this Thule society, which was just basically the further extension of this Prussian uh, corporatist group. The Prussian corporatist group developing airships was called NIMSA, uh, Nationalistic Jag Flugzeug Maschinen Zahlungsamt, the, the uh, Nationalist Airship uh, Pursuit and Exploration office. And this basically became the Thule Society. And it was organized around this etheric energy concept that was at the core of all of Tesla's technological innovations. The other thing about Tesla is that when you look at the, the drawings for the Wardenclyffe Tower and so forth, you'll notice that the sky, the night sky, is full of airships. And Tesla designed these airships himself. They're cigar-shaped craft that don't have any understandable means of propulsion, very similar to a lot of things that were seen across the Western yeah, states in the 1890s, right? And so long story short, I think what happened is this, is that uh, poor idealistic Nikola Tesla wanted to give this technology to the whole world and have it be publicly developed. And a group of people who had already happened upon the same science and technology who were working with the same scientific model had uh, had some of the same technical breakthroughs. They basically 
damaged Tesla's um, endeavor. They basically, uh, you know, derailed his his uh, projects and ultimately put him on a path to destitution, um, especially through uh, the defunding of Wardenclyffe by J.P. Morgan, the same J.P. Morgan who was financing the Prussian airship venture, the same J.P. Morgan who was funneling money into Europe to facilitate the rise of the Third Reich. Wow. Okay. I did not, I did not, I've not, I've not made that connection. That's really cool. And by the way, Nikki, the Chase Bank logo, in case you've never noticed, is a swastika. Go take a yeah, look at I, it. Yeah, I, I, that was recently pointed out to me and I, and I have an account at Chase and I was like, damn. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's crazy. Um, uh, yeah, okay. So my, I guess, but you know, there there have been UFO sightings even like back in the 1500s in uh, in Germany, actually over Germany, uh, and even even the even even before that. So like that's it's kind of been an ongoing phenomenon. So how far back does this go? Right. Um, here's the problem, and and again, like I don't want uh, uh, to melt people's brains right away. Okay, so let's just take this slowly. Uh, here's the problem. It's a problem involving time and the nature of time. Because when you're dealing with the manipulation of gravity, you're dealing with the warping of space-time. So in Nazi Germany, uh, actually in Prague, in occupied Prague uh, in 1944, uh, there was a project called Kronos. In other words, Project Time. Kronos is the ancient Greek lord of time, the ancient Greek titan of time. And there was this project run by uh, Hans Kammler uh, at a think tank uh, named after him, the Kammler Stab, the, Ka the Kammler Staff, a think tank located in the outskirts of Prague. And they were developing a uh, nine to 12 foot uh, tall bell-shaped device, which contained two counter-rotating cylinders, um, counter-rotating through electromagnetic force, right? So this thing would be it was powered by alternating current, and it was repeatedly shocked by direct current, which would make these uh, cylinders counter-rotate. And the cylinders were, were rotating a serum that was a compound of uh, a certain isotope of mercury with thorium. And the idea was that based on this alternative physics model that Tesla was already working with, subjecting this serum to torsion in that way, uh, shocking it electromagnetically, would cause a reaction in the mercury thorium, the way that, let's say, you're trying to cause a fission or a fusion reaction in uranium or plutonium in a nuclear weapon, right? Okay. It, it causes a reaction in this serum which opens up something like a singularity. It creates a vortex. The vorticular structure of the mercury thorium uh, coagulates into a controlled singularity. And this um, can become a source of power. So then, you know, you got uh, uh, electrical cables hooked up to this bell, and suddenly the energy that's coming out of this thing is greater than the energy that's coming into it. It's like a power plant. But what they also noticed in Project Kronos, I don't think it's, they noticed it. Actually, I think they, the name of the project shows yeah. that this is really what they were after, is that there would be time distortion effects. The scientists, the first uh, series of scientists involved with this project started to notice that time was going by at a different rate for them inside the laboratory than it was in the outside world. I mean, not drastically, but perceptibly. And they all came, came down with kind of organ failure, okay? And a lot of them died. So then they started testing this thing on plants and they would see that the plants that were put inside the bell enclosure on a ceramic floor and so on and so forth, these plants would just like, basically uh, they would atrophy from inside. They would like just uh, degenerate on a cellular level and, and collapse in on themselves. Uh, and then they tested it on concentration camp inmates. Hmm. And they basically realized that We've got a device here that warps space time. And yes, you can get energy out of it. But you know, the, the greater significance of this thing is that, oh, and it levitated, right? So when they would turn this thing on, they had to have it chained to a rig because it would levitate. 
due to a, to a development of a local gravitational field around the singularity. And so they had a power plant that was also a space-time warping device. All right, now, how do we get from there to UFOs, right? Uh, and the whole history of UFO sightings. There was another project also located, I don't know what these people had with Prague. Why, I mean, I guess it's a beautiful city or something. But they also had another project located around Prague um, that was attempting to solve the problem of what's called the suctioning of the boundary layer in, uh, in aeronautical design. So, you know, an aircraft traveling at very high speed, an aircraft that has wings, that has any kind of protuberances, traveling at very high speed, develops a sheath or pocket of air resistance around it, which impedes the speed and maneuverability of the aircraft. And so, uh, you know, the Germans, like any other great aeronautical engineers, started to think of ways that they could get rid of what this, this boundary layer, they call it the boundary layer. How could they get rid of this boundary layer especially to develop military aircraft that would be better in dogfights. They could turn faster, you know? And so they started putting slots inside uh, the airframe and with, you know, vacuums inside them. So the slots would basically vacuum off the boundary layer. They would suction the boundary layer. And long story short, they came to the conclusion that, th uh, so they started designing more and more aerodynamic craft. And for example, you get the Horton Brothers design that was the prototype for what we then took and turned into the B-2 uh, stealth bomber. They had this flying wing, right? And the whole reason they were developing stuff like the flying wing, the reason the Hortons and others were doing this, was to get rid of the boundary layer, to create the most aerodynamic aircraft you could uh, with these suction vents and so forth. And finally, they came to the conclusion that the best design for something like that is an aircraft that has no wings at all. It would be a circular airframe a disc-shaped airframe where there are suction vents all around the disc. And it's just suctioning off the entire boundary layer. So there's no air resistance around this thing. And as they put it, it can slip through the air like, like a, a, a soap bar. It just, you know, and you can make 90 degree turns at very high velocities. So they were building this airframe. Uh, and these things, these saucers, uh, Habermal, Mife, um, and uh, who was the other guy? Um, there was an Italian involved also, Boluzzo, because they were you know, collaborating obviously with Mussolini's government. These people uh, developed a jet powered airframe for the purposes of uh, ultimate aerodynamic maneuverability. But then they had this Bell project going on, right? So there's some evidence to suggest that at the very end of the war, uh, like early 1945, they combined the bell and the saucer airframe, replaced the jet uh, propulsion system of the saucer with the bell as its power plant and created basically an anti-gravity saucer airframe craft with ultimate maneuverability. And its flight was witnessed by Otto Skorzeny the master of, of uh, psychological warfare and, and special operations who had extracted Mussolini uh, from the prison where the allies were, were, were holding him. That guy whose specialty was psychological warfare was on site at Prague when they tested this thing. And the people who knew him say that from that day on, Skorzeny was possessed by the idea of using this as a weapon in a psychological war against the United States. Wow. What that makes me think, though, too, about the like the time dilation within within the saucer or within the bell shape thing is maybe that's why we have the um, the little grays, like the little because like a lot of people say they're android or they're not a hundred percent biological. Uh, there's some sort of they're literally like kind of like a biological robot. So I wonder if if that's maybe why they are the pilots. I agree completely. Um, you know, people don't realize that um, because, you know, I don't want to, how, how, how do I put this? I mean, I have a lot of respect for researchers like David Jacobs. They've come up with a lot of, of good data in terms of like actual field work with abductees and so forth. But often their frameworks of interpretation actually occlude 
you know, some of the data. They come to it with fixed, come to even data they produce themselves with very fixed ideas. Like for example, in a, in a lot of the cases that Jacobs looked at, people would remember tall blondes looking over them. And Jacobs, you know, came to the uh, conclusion, I mean, he made the assumption that these grays are like somehow putting images of uh, you know, beautiful looking tall blondes into people's minds in order to console them somehow. Well, actually, you know, we have a lot of abduction cases like the case of Travis Walton, where people have seen these grays together with the tall blondes. And Walton in particular was convinced that the grays were robots, that they were biological robots who were working for the tall blondes. And, you know, if you were engaged in mass abductions of people, You'd be, you'd be morons to go do it yourself. Obviously, you're going to send the robots to do that, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you're going to send the robots on these little scout ships. And maybe, the, you know, uh, there's also issues that have to do with radiation, why you wouldn't want to necessarily be in those scout ships. And you bring them back to a place where, you know, maybe you have some degree of interaction with them. But mostly that will be handled by the androids. Uh, so, so, yeah, um, I agree with you. So what, like, how does how does this connect to the the moon? Because I know the moon um, is supposedly has as as I'm well, it's it's odd that we haven't been back in fifty years, right? So you know, I was always underneath the impression that either the whole damn thing's a hoax, or there's or or you know, it is somewhere there. And I and I'm a big Linda Moulton Howe fan, and I'm I I I'm, and I and I've heard you talk about how, you know. Um, the astronauts don't really have any memory of what's going on there. And then also uh, there is like Linda Moulton Howe had some sort of interview where a friend of uh, Armstrong said that he said that when they got there, there was people there already. So how, how are they, how, how are the moon based people connected? Like, do you think that this is the people who are developing this in the 1800s? who went up there? Or do you think that that's more like Atlantean? They've been there way longer. That's like the monitoring race. What do you think is going on with that? You know, it's very hard to talk about these things because, um, I mean, I've come to some conclusions about this that are just, they're, they're appalling. They're, they're appalling and mind boggling. Um, so, so, okay, how, how to approach this. Ingo Swan was the leading remote viewer uh, for the Stanford Research Institute project that was funded by the CIA in the early 1970s to basically keep up with the Soviets and the psychic espionage that they were doing. And you know, he helped develop the protocols and, and so forth for the program. And in the mid 1970s, Ingo Swan was contacted by uh, someone in an even um, uh, deeper black project who, uh, again, long story short, took him to a, an underground facility and had him remote view the moon. And Ingo Swan saw a titanic megalithic city on the backside of the moon. It wasn't made of metal. It, was, it looked like Teotihuacan, uh, except that there were also you know, radio uh, telescope type dishes there. And I mean, clearly advanced technological structures, but mostly not made of metal. There were obelisks. There were various types of polygonal buildings. And here's the most disturbing thing. Ingo Swan said that the people on the moon look like Europeans. They're these tall, you know, Nordic looking people. And they were employing slave labor to mine the moon. Okay. Now, it's one thing if just some remote viewer says this, but the guy who had him on this project, this, this Mr. Axelrod who recruited him to do this, said the reason that he had brought Ingo in was because they had photographic reconnaissance of this city and they wanted to check their interpretations of what they could see in the photographs uh, against what a remote viewer would come up with. And so that brings us to the story about uh, you know, uh, what Carl Wolf saw. Carl Wolf was a um, photographic reconnaissance uh, repairman. He would fix the machines that were bringing in images from the U2, U2 uh, spy planes and the uh, spy satellites that we're using in the 60s and so forth to spy on Soviet missile installations. And he was at Langley Air Force Base and he was told by his commanding officer to go to this building uh, run by the NSA. And at that time, you know, nobody knew what the hell the NSA was. The NSA was super secret until like the 19, late 70s, early 80s. Nobody even knew the agency existed. I mean, common people. Even in the military, he didn't know the agency existed. So he assumed it was a NASA facility. And in particular, he assumed that because when he got there, 
they were processing images from uh, the lunar orbital reconnaissance, okay? And Wolf goes into this room to fix this machine that's processing uh, images from, from uh, lunar uh, orbiting satellites and creating mosaics of these, of these images. And he basically sees a base on the backside of the moon. I mean, not a base, a city, okay, a gigantic city. And Wolf had no idea about Ingo Swan's testimony and vice versa. And Wolf says that what he saw in these photographs, which were incredibly high fidelity photographs, like made by you know, satellites of the same type that can read license plates from space. And he, he described exactly the same type of megalithic structures that Ingo Swan did, uh, you know, um, saying that it looked more like manufactured stone than you know, any kind of metallic structure or steel and glass or anything like that. Uh, so we have independent confirmation of the kind of things that Ingo saw on the moon. And so then you have to ask yourself, like, what the hell is going on here? Why are there a bunch of white people up on the moon? Uh, you know, what, how, is it, how are they using slave labor, right? And like, how is this connected to saucers that were being manufactured at the end of the war? Okay. Um, and so- and Why wait, haven't we been back since 1972? I mean, they, they can't use the, they throw money away like it's water. So if they can't use the money, the money, uh, you know, cause that's a big, any, anytime you ask a complete and total, I don't know what the right word is, muggle is what I like to say, or like a sleep person, they'll just be like, it's because it's expensive and we already went like, why would you go? That's their, that's the reason they give you, but there has to be a real, if we went, there has to be a really, really real reason we haven't gone back in 50 years. I want to come back and talk about the Nordics, but before that, I want to say something really hair-raising, uh, with, with, you know, in response to what you just said, right? Why, why haven't we gone back to the moon in 40 years? First of all, we didn't need to go to the moon in rockets. There were numerous mainstream media stories in the 1950s, in the mid 1950s, in like the New York Herald Tribune, that were quoting. Um, the top aeronautics journals of the time saying that leading American aerospace companies like uh, Martin Aircraft, which later merged with Lockheed and became Lockheed Martin, Convair, um, Lear, you know, the guy who invented the Learjet. Yeah. These corporations were all about to develop anti-gravity aircraft. This was reported on at length in tens of tens of articles stretching from 1954 to 1956 in mainstream American press, okay? And you had people like, uh, you know, the, the chairman of Lear Corporation come out and say, yeah, we're, you know, we've already demonstrated that this works in the laboratory. It's just an engineering, you know, it, it's just an engineering project at this point. We just need enough funding to develop this on a large scale. Um, you had uh, the head of Martin Aircraft, again, which later became Lockheed Martin, say that um, within a time span equal to the Manhattan Project, they would be able to have craft that could create a local gravitational field and take you from New York to Sydney in one hour. And that these things could go into space without the pilots feeling any kind of you know, zero gravity or any kind of even, uh, you know, perturbance. I mean, they would like, it would feel like standing on the surface of the earth because the craft had a local gravitational field. And they're giving like statements to the press about this stuff and holding conferences on it. Then all of a sudden in 1959, dead silence. And no one ever reports on this again. No one ever hears about it again. There's like a couple of stories where the same newspapers like the New York Herald Tribune that had been reporting on it say, well, we can't get any word out of Martin Aircraft about the gravity thing they were telling us about for years. Maybe it's because they've had some breakthrough and now it's been declared top secret. Okay, so the first thing you have to realize, and then, you know, it's, it's worthy of note in that regard that before Ben Rich, the CEO of Lockheed died in like the 1990s or something, he had made a statement to the effect that we have had the technology to take ET back home, but it'll never be released to the public, right? And this is the same Lockheed, you know, that merged with Martin Aircraft that was developing these things in the 1950s. So the first thing you have to realize is that the whole goddamn Apollo mission was a smokescreen. The whole thing was, and who was running it? Okay, Werner von Braun, yeah. 
wasn't just your average rank and file Nazi. The guy was an SS major who was using slave labor inside hollowed out mountains to build V2 rockets to pour down on civilians, all right? Uh, and then he, he created an Apollo program team that consisted of like Kurt Davis and you know, half a dozen other high ranking Nazis, like 70% of the Apollo team consisted of his buddies from the SS, from back in the SS days. And they were setting mission dates. I think the, these guys had a lot of fun with this. They were really having a lot of fun setting mission dates according to holidays celebrated only by the Third Reich, like Hitler's birthday. So the Apollo astronauts all said, Apollo 11, uh, 12, 13, they all said that they saw UFOs either on the way to the moon or on the moon, lights dancing at the edges of craters and so forth. And so I think what was going on was basically these guys at Martin Aircraft and these other companies who had developed this technology were you know, making jokes at the expense of these poor astronauts who were being sent up in these tin cans in zero gravity uh, because they were already there. Now, the question though you have to ask yourself is, because these in the 1950s, these reports in mainstream media were not saying that they already had anti-gravity craft. They were saying it had been demonstrated in a laboratory and they were about to start manufacturing these things. So, so why the dead silence? I think what happened was that, and this is gonna take us somewhere else that has to do with the intelligence community. I think that what happened was uh, after putting up with this for a couple of years, some people very high up in the intelligence community came to like the CEO of Martin Aircraft, came to uh, you know, the chairman of Lear and said, listen, folks, we have this already. And we'll deal you in. But you have to understand, this stuff is not going to be developed in the public sphere. Um, and so they were basically dealt into a, an existing black project developing this technology, a project that continued from the work that had been done in Prague uh, you know, by Hans Kammler and by... Oh. Are you kind of saying that basically like this breakaway society, anytime the 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 little the the outsiders get close to something that they already have, that's when they'll bring them in and shut them up kind of thing? Yeah, something, like something like that. Something like that. Specifically in this case, we have to look at the Central Intelligence Agency and what it really is. Okay. Um, in nineteen forty-five. Uh, when we, you know, when we went in to Eastern, to, to Germany, and we were confronted with the threat of the Soviet Union potentially marching across Western Europe, right? Um, we, uh, the OSS, the, the wartime U.S. intelligence agency, the OSS, made a deal with an existing East European Nazi spy network run by General Reinhard Galen. Uh, and that deal was brokered by who? Alan Dulles, the same Alan Dulles that had been business partners with JP Morgan back in the airship days. Uh, and then, you know, who helped fund the rise of the Third Reich, right? This Alan Dulles, who was business partners with Morgan and with, who was the other third man? Rockefeller, who is an oil magnate, who's just discovered a bunch of oil that he wants to sell. And the last thing he wants is free energy based on tapping the ether, right? So Rockefeller is the third man here. Anyway. Alan Dulles brokers this deal where General Reinhard Galen's existing spy network in Eastern Europe will basically be absorbed into the OSS so that the Americans don't have to create their own spy network in Eastern Europe to spy on the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union's gone and they've taken Poland, Romania, all these countries, right? East Germany. And instead of developing from scratch a spy network in Eastern Europe to report on the communists, well, we just absorbed General Galen's organization. And what was the fusion of the OSS and the Galen Org? It was called the Central Intelligence Agency. So the Central Intelligence Agency from the ground up was instituted by hardcore Nazis, mostly Nazis of Eastern European extraction, Ukrainians, Romanians, and so forth, Polish people. And what's the first thing the CIA does? Operation Paperclip. They create all these false dossiers to import thousands of high-ranking German scientists in various fields, bring them into this country, patriate them, and uh, establish them as our new military industrial complex. So these people are controlling intelligence. They, they uh, instituted the National Security Act of 1947 that completely undermined our constitution and gave ultimate sovereign authority to the intelligence community, an intelligence community that 
is now full of Nazi spies. And these Nazi spies bring over their scientist buddies by the thousands and set them up as the bedrock of our military industrial complex. So it's pretty clear to me who came to Martin Aircraft and to Lear in the late 1950s and said, uh, I don't think so. And by the way, we are, you're reinventing the wheel. We already have it. And you can work on it with us, but you know this is not going to the public. So then this goes back to that, that whole concept that you talk about, like uh, the noble lie. And do you think that this is, like, do you ultimately think that the secrets are because you don't want some psychopath getting a hold of this kind of, you know, because that's a good argument, right? Uh, you could do a lot of damage with this stuff or, but at this, at this point, uh, I don't know. I kind of feel like it's, it's just time. It's, there's too much. Okay. But to that same point, okay. Everybody's talking about two stars Academy and like Chris Mellon, Chris Mellon is it as in Carnegie Mellon, as in his granddad is our, the one who also is Gulf oil also hugely connected like he's part of the the global elite like so he's one of your your big people coming out about this and I find that weird that no one's talking about that connection and uh and it they're they're all kind of falling into in my opinion uh project bluebeam where it's kind of like oh there's this big threat this 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 threat that we need to talk about so how do you how do you see it coming into modern day Look, uh, this thing is so, I mean, it's an insult to our intelligence. Anyone who spent any time studying the close encounter phenomenon, the idea that this Mellon character just somehow managed to leak a few videos and then there was a public outcry and, you know, like Lou Elizondo, the hero, you know, who's like, you know, turned against the intelligence community and is a champion for disclosure. And right. now we're going to know what's been going on all these years. It's a, such, a, it, I mean, it's just, Look, at least if you're going to come up with a uh, disinformation operation, do a little better of a job than that. This is an insult to our intelligence. We have like how many decades of, of UFO encounters recorded by the military, by the Air Force, by the Navy, going back to the 1950s. Uh, you know, uh, people like, um, what was his name? Kehoe, Major Kehoe, writing in the 1950s, coming out of the Air Force about all the encounters that they had. So, so what you're now you're going to tell us about like, I don't know, a handful of cases involving the Omaha and this one and that one, you know, over the last right. decade, which probably were staged, by the way, using, you know, American anti what, what American anti gravity technology developed by the military industrial complex in the in the United States, which I actually think is not loyally American, it's something else. Uh, so yeah, of course, it's a disinformation operation. These people are military intelligence officers, you're going to believe them. And it's setting us up. So the question you have to ask yourself, which you're already asking implicitly is why? Why now? Yeah. What are they trying to set up here? What are we gonna be told, right? Advanced threat identification. Oh, threat from who? And who are you gonna tell us is gonna protect us once this threat is identified, right? What kind of a political system are we gonna be ensconced in after you tell us that there's this planetary threat that you need to protect us from? Yeah, that's, that's the thing that really bothers me about everything is they keep on talking about the threat aspect of it. And I'm like going, this stuff has been going on since who knows when. And it's, 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 the, it's been going on all the time for the last 70 years. And then just now, this is the first time you're admitting it. And I don't know, the whole thing uh, for me is just very, very fishy. And don't trust it, people. <laughs> That's Absolutely I mean. not. And I'll take, I'll give you another huge reason why you shouldn't trust it. Okay. Um, now this is going to seem crazy. Maybe not to the people who watch, uh, who watch yeah, your program. Right? Hey, no, like I've know. seen unicorns, yeah. like people, I mean, are, they watch me, really, they know I'm crazy. So don't worry about it. Who are we really even talking to anyway right now? Right. Okay. In any case, um, as crazy as this might sound, uh, I, I will tell you up front that I, that I think that the answer to my, my rhetorical question earlier is that I think that we are going to be told in, in a couple of decades, not right now, this June disclosure is the beginning of a long process of right. psychosocial manipulation that's going to take place around this phenomenon. And ultimately, what we're going to be told is that there are these tall, white, Nordic looking people who are here to protect us. And they're like our elders, um, they're our ancestors. And 
there are these really bad people here that have been exploiting us, these little grays, and they abduct people and they implant people. And you know, they're, they're gonna hide that for a long time. There's, there's not gonna be a word about abductions or implants or anything in this June disclosure. And there probably won't be for another decade. But eventually that stuff will be released, but it'll be released in the context of a good cop, bad cop, uh, hydra, psychological manipulation structure where we're gonna be told that the grays are these evil invaders and that these tall, beautiful, blonde people are here to protect us. Um, and you know the, we're gonna be under their wing and they're gonna look out for us. And in that respect, it's very important to go back to the contactee phenomena of the 1950s um, and people like George Adamski. You know, Billy Meyer, you know, saw all these uh, tall blonde people supposedly interacted with them. Um, uh, Van Tassel was another one. Uh, but I think George Adamski is the key to understanding who these tall Nordic people are. Because when you dig into the Adamski case, you find out that his closest collaborator, who went by the name George Hunt Williamson, but whose real name was Michel Dobronovich, was a military intelligence officer who had worked for an organization called the Silver Shirts in the 1930s and early 40s, uh, 1930s through the 40s. So the Silver Shirts were a group of American Nazis um, headed by William Dudley Pelly. And they had some bizarre, uh, it was like the first UFO cult. They had some bizarre space oriented theology where supposedly some master race came from space and mated with uh, hominins on this planet and created all the other races except for the white race. And the white race is this master race that came from space. And they had these, these journals that they would publish and uh, you know, Nazi style uniforms with, a, with silver shirts that became characteristic of their movement. And uh, Michel Dobrinovich was the editor for their journal. This Michel Dobrinovich, who was also a military intelligence officer and who had degrees in archaeology and anthropology, winds up becoming the handler of George Adamski, albeit under the name George Hunt Williamson. And so, and then when you read Adamski's descriptions of the saucers that he supposedly walked into, the technical dimensions of those descriptions match perfectly with the technology that was being developed in Prague by uh, Mithe and Schriever and uh, you know, the, the power plant that, um, that um, Hans Kammler was responsible for uh, overseeing in, in Project Kronos. So it looks to me like the contactee phenomenon wasn't emanating from Venus or necessarily the Pleiades or wherever these people were lying and saying they were coming from. It was emanating from some kind of an occulted Reich. And so here that brings us back to the whole idea of the subterranean and the suboceanic and where can you go to, to set up a, a, an occulted breakaway civilization. And we know that beginning with the German Antarctic expedition of 1938, the Germans began to develop some kind of a naval facility in Antarctica. They even made public proclamations about this head of the German Navy came out and said in the early uh, 40s, that they had created an impregnable fortress, a Shangri-La amidst the ice for the Fuhrer. Uh, and lo and behold, in 1945, after the end of the war, we intercept U-boats between Argentina and Antarctica. And as a, I think probably provoked by that incident, they sent Admiral Byrd, Admiral Richard Byrd, down uh, to Antarctica with a huge fleet in 1946 in Operation High Jump a fleet that you know looks more like a military expedition than any kind of you know reconnaissance effort, uh, and these guys came back way ahead of schedule with their ships severely damaged. And I, I believe at a port uh, in Chile, on the way back to the United States, the, the Chilean press got a hold of Bird before he could be debriefed by you know officials back in Washington. And Bird said, uh, "We have to be prepared." for a third world war in which we will encounter uh, enemy aircraft that can fly from pole to pole at tremendous speed. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs>
uh yeah okay well i don't even know where to go from there because I, I okay i mean but still the thing that i keep coming back to is i i feel like there's a long game like a real like these like like these whatever uh, i don't know if you want to call it deep state or uh, breakaway civilization or whatever but it feels like it is longer lived than you and i like it feels like they play a very long game so i don't know if they're vampires or if they're uh they are the gods they are i i don't know what they are but they they and i know that they are human but am i am i off base and thinking that these no. things live longer than us absolutely okay so look what was the other area the Nazis were really into besides, you know, exotic uh, propulsion and, and, and uh, you know, aeronautical like psychic abilities? Um, oh, well, certainly that. That's yeah. another thing. That's I, that's not, you know. That's a whole other subject we could get into. But. Well, no, I mean, it's closely related because every one of these contactees claimed that uh, the, these tall Nordics were telepathic and, you know, uh, extrasensory perception and psychokinesis are part and parcel of all of these contactee reports throughout the 1950s. Okay, so one of the ways that these, these uh, Nordics, quote unquote, were convincing uh, Adamski and, and Billy Meyer and others that they were aliens was that they would demonstrate these extraordinary psychic abilities. And in particular, there's a case, I don't wanna go into this at length right now, but just a sort of side note, in Italy in the 1950s uh, around Rome, um, there, were, there were a group of people uh, who claimed contact again with European looking uh, extraterrestrials. And their accounts of um, their involvement with these so-called Amici, these friends, like Space Brothers, friends is what they call themselves, are full of incidents of telepathy and psychokinesis. So they were using you know, these psychic powers to awe them into believing they were dealing with aliens. Anyway, so yes, they, the Nazis were deep into uh, psychic research. Our American psychic research and the Soviet psychic research were both uh, based on what we discovered when we went into Germany. But where I was, where I was actually going was the, uh, the Nazi interest in genetic research, right? right? And although it has to be said, this is another area where people uh, too narrowly focus on the Nazis. The idea of creating a master race through eugenics came from America. It came from Anglo-Saxons in America and these people who, again, funded the rise of the Reich in Germany, I mean, it, it went both ways. You had Prussians funding development in America, and then you had American financiers and industrialists funding the rise of the Third Reich in Germany, right? So there's this symbiotic relationship. But my point is that um, the idea of developing a master race through genetic manipulation was imported fully from America into Nazi Germany, and it was another area of research that they were obsessed with. Right? So, I mean, if you have people who live longer than us, well, that, that uh, you know, suggests that they've cracked the genetic code and, you know, altered human genetics in a way that drastically expands yeah. lifespan. Um, and where this is all really taking us is back to why Project Kronos was called what it was called. And, you know, th th this is the, the brain melting uh, conclusion to all of this that I didn't want to throw at people up front. Think about it this way. Time travel, if it's feasible, and, you know, physicists admit that it's feasible. If time travel is possible, which it is, it's got to be invented by somebody at some point in human history, right? I mean, there's got to be somebody who's there when that happens there are going to be the people who are the first people who just happen to crack time travel as a technology. Well, look, uh, if uh, the SS was manipulating space-time with a device like the Bell, they're not only going to get anti-gravity from out of that, they're going to get a space-time warping device from out of that. And I think one of the reasons that this spider uh, of, of the, you know, the Nazi uh, intelligence apparatus imported into the United States descended on those aerospace companies in the 1950s and told them to shut up is because they said, listen, you idiots don't realize 
You're not just developing some aircraft that's going to get people from New York to Sydney in an hour. This anti-gravity technology is going to produce a time machine. And that's not technology that we can release to the public because it's going to dis disrupt the time continuum. I mean, look, the ultimate secret project is the project to develop time travel technology. By nature, intrinsically, it has to be a secret because you can't have Joe, Charlie, and Mo dicking around with the timeline on a regular basis because they want to, you know, like use their foreknowledge of the stock market to get rich or something or bring back a dead relative or whatever. You can't do that. That's a technology that needs to be extremely tightly controlled. So that brings us to, to you know, the question that you keep asking. What about the antiquity of this phenomenon, right? I mean, why is there a megalithic city on the dark side of the moon that looks like what's in Egypt, that looks like what's in, you know, Tiwanaku? Uh, why did the Mayans tell us that tall white gods came to them in boats without paddles and brought them civilization? Right? I mean, why is this the description of the Anunnaki? I I'm sorry to say, you know, I, I can really only come to one conclusion. It's a terrible conclusion, okay? It's a terrible conclusion, but look, the, the Germans and their, uh, you know, associated corporatists in the Anglo-American world were ahead of everybody else in the world in every other area of technology. Why would we not assume that if by the mid 1950s, American aerospace companies were on the verge of manufacturing these kinds of um, anti-gravity time machines, why would we not assume that the Germans were there a decade earlier? Yeah. So you think the Germans in, are discovered time travel basically and are... I, I don't see any um, anthropologically sound reason why uh, why it would be the case that only white people are seen aboard these UFOs, right? I mean, people see grays, which I think are androids. People see reptilians, which, I mean, that's a whole other subject we could get into, but I think there are genetically spliced species, that they're not a naturally evolved species. But as far as human beings, right? I mean, humans. There are no black people apparently on these, you know, UFOs. There are no like Japanese people. Why, why are there only white people? And why is it the case? I mean, there's no anthropological reason for that. Why is it the case also that these civilizer gods that we encounter in the records of the ancient Egyptians and the South Americans and, and also by the way, in China, you know, there are pyramids in China and there are mummified remains of tall white people that have been found in China around the same area as those pyramids. Um, and I think one of the reasons that the Chinese don't want the archeological community in those pyramids is that they're gonna find mummies of these tall white people and it's gonna have to rewrite the history of Chinese civilization, which they don't want, right? So, I mean, what is the deal with these tall white civilizer gods? What if? I mean, what if we have to consider the horrifying possibility that the Nordics, quote unquote, are literally Nordics. I mean, they're literally Anglo-Saxons who came up with time travel before anybody else. And they have royally fucked the time continuum on this planet. Yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of plausibility in that actually, yeah. That's kind of, uh, it's funny, but it's, I mean, but it's probably, I mean, it's not, I mean, you have a lot of points that kind of match up with it. Um, I do, I do wonder about things like how how do you put uh, deja vu's or like Mandela effect or living dead time? Like, how do you how do you put that in this? Excellent question. So it's at the center of all this. Think about it this way. Um, if the mainstream physics community is correct that the only way time travel is possible is if it leads to closed time-like curves, they call the CTC, uh, closed time-like curves. In other words, that we live in a universe where there's block time, where everything that we think is going to happen in the future has already happened. And 
all we're doing is kind of like moving through uh, a pre-mapped contour of space-time. And we're fated to, to do things, OK? Because the fabric of space-time is entirely uniform. By the way, I'm going to completely reject this notion. I know, I, I know you don't like this theory. Yeah. So the fabric of space-time is completely uniform going back into the past and into the future, right? It's just one fifth dimensional uh, block, as they call it, at the, you know, block of time. And when you time travel, you create closed time-like curves um, where nothing that you do when you travel into the past can wind up being inconsistent with the past as it's been recorded. You'll just make true what already we know as a matter of history was true, right? Um, so, so just space-time is going to work in a way where you're not going to be able to kill your grandfather, right? right? Because otherwise you wouldn't have been able to go back in time, right? So, because you wouldn't be. Uh, so, and according to this bizarre idea, they think it's possible that like, for example, a time traveler version of you from the future could come back and hand you your doctoral dissertation when you're in grad school and before you've written it, right? And you could write your doctoral dissertation by just plagiarizing yourself from the future. And that's how your doctoral dissertation came into being, right? Which on the face of it, it just assaults our logic. But well, where, where the hell did that thing come from in the first place? Where did the time traveler from the future get it if you know he's the one who gave it to the grad student version of himself? And they say, well, you just got to forget all that. Just forget it. You know, it's, it, it's a block universe. And you didn't really write the dissertation anyway, because you're an automaton and we have no free will, right? I think this is all a load of crap. This, this, is, this is a wrong-minded, materialistic, mechanistic physics paradigm. Time travel does change the past. Time travel is so dangerous precisely because it changes the past. And so the Mandela effect is a question of people remembering how things were in a previous version of the past before one or another in, instance of time travel has altered the timeline. And if I were to, to, to grope for a physics that could explain something like that, I'd say that we're living in a computational cosmos. This cosmos is an information processing system. And it works the way a computer works in the sense that you can save past states of play in a video game and go back to them and replay the game from that point onward in a different way, right? So there's like a CPU somewhere that stores a past version of the cosmos. Uh, and when people experience the Mandela effect, it's because these people are tapping into that Akashic record, as it were. I think the mystical notion of the Akashic record is based actually on a feature of this information processing system that is saving alternate versions of the past, which were altered by various instances of time travel. So I think there is a struggle over shaping human history, um, a struggle that was initiated by these people who, you know, cracked time travel technology. Yeah, and maybe that's like we're going through a lot of timeline edits that, you know, keep on making weird anomalies in the in this in the space in the time space fabric. You know, like I, I I've talked about on my channel how um, I went to the eclipse in Chile. 2018 in the summer of 2018 and the day after the eclipse I was at this like a little port town and I have 30 minute deja vu that wouldn't end and it was so uncomfortable to be in like I knew exactly what was about to happen the next second before you know and I had been there before even though I've never been to Chile before for and 30 minutes th it lasted 30 minutes it was at first it was wow. like super cool and then it was super uncomfortable and I told my friend like hey this like I'm having this deja vu and it like won't end. And she was like, whatever, you know, and she kept on and I finally told, okay, look, I've already told this to you before and stuff. But I'm just going to tell you how it ends. And she was like, okay, how does it end? And I told her, we're going to find this banister. We were on our way looking, trying to get to the, to go see the sunset. And so we were walking around all this graffiti, taking pictures of like this really cool street art. And I, I told her, we're going to get to like this banister and there's going to be a little, a little gateway and there's the stairs that go down like I don't know like about 100 feet and then there's going to be these little kids shoes at the bottom of the stairs 
and she was like if that happens then you know you're crazy like you're crazy psychic or something and I it, it was like I'm not psychic I'm inside of a deja vu right now and that's how it ended a hundred percent everything just like I said the stairs with little kid shoes at the bottom of it and I don't know how I would have made that up it was just so random and just so crazy and uh fascinating from a parapsychology perspective because it's not just deja vu it's precognition but what it looks like is happening is that the deja vu is so intense and so prolonged that it has precognitive qualities to it like it's like your consciousness you're remembering that this has already happened is so dilated that you can see future parts of that memory that haven't unfolded in real time yet which suggests that there's some kind of relationship between deja vu and precognition, but usually we don't notice it because our deja vu episodes are so short. They're so short, yeah. And it felt just the way the, you know, the, how the, the deja vu, as soon as you realize you're in the deja vu, you're kind of going, oh, I've been here. And then it sort of like melts away and it's gone. It, 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 like that, when you first realize it, that heightened moment where you know you're in the center of the deja vu lasted half an hour. It was, okay. but I have to say it was super uncomfortable. Hell yeah, I could imagine. I mean, I've been creeped out by like a few minute long deja vus. I can only imagine. Yeah, so I always kind of think like, for me, the way I, I've i been kind of, where I've put that in is, is I'm thinking like, yeah, maybe we were in the middle of a timeline edit and that's like- That's like, what Philip K. Dick said in, you know, at that conference in France, in Metz, uh, France in 1977, where Philip K. Dick said, you know, Look, I confess, I didn't make up all of my novels. You know, some elements of these novels came from memories that I have of an alternate timeline. And deja vu is a clue to when the timeline is being edited. And that we're living basically in a, sim he called it a simulation. Mm. Um, I, I don't think it's a simulation. I don't think that's exactly the accurate terminology because a simulacrum is a simulacrum of something that's more real. Like there's a real world and then we're in a simulation inside of the real world, right? I think we just live in a fundamentally computational cosmos. There may be many different worlds inside that computational cosmos that are like, quote unquote, virtual realities, except that there's no one reality that's any more real than any of them. It's just a nested computational cosmos. Uh, so yeah, I wouldn't necessarily use the terminology of simulation, but I think basically Dick had the right idea. Well, I mean, and I also feel like, I don't know if you've ever, have you personally done any um, remote viewing? Have you ever taken not any? In, not in a formal sense. Well, I, I haven't in a formal, like with military or anything, but I've taken some Udemy classes and I've done some videos online or whatever. And how well it works is depressing, actually. It's not like I go like, oh, yay, I'm good at remote viewing. I go like the fact that this works for me is some sort of we're in some kind of simulation it creeps There's you out something about that's weird yeah 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 you know i've known some of the top remote viewers um uh yeah i, I probably shouldn't mention any names but I, I i i've been able to spend time with some of the people who were integral to the program uh particularly in the 1980s phase of it and uh it's remarkable what they can do. And, you know, it's a great, it's a great um, method whereby to obtain otherwise inaccessible information about the close encounter phenomenon. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Jason, I've had you for an hour and a half. I'm going to, I'm going to let you get on with your day. This was amazing. I loved it. So, so tell us a little bit where people can find you and about like, I noticed you wrote two books in um, 2020 and that you're, are also have announced that you're, you're going to write one specifically on the ET encounters. So walk us through that a little bit. Yeah. People can just go to Jason Reza Giorgiani.com. So yes, I'm working on a book uh, that's focused on the close encounter phenomenon um, right now. Uh, the subtitle of the book will probably be something like the meaning of close encounters and you know it'll be very philosophical like the rest of my works um but yeah i have uh, i've written two books already uh i held them up already prometheism and and faustian futurist that have to do with this phenomenon but now i'm going to dig deeper into the details and try to provide some kind of comprehensive interpretation 
uh, which I've already hinted at what it is, you know, in this program. And, you know, let me just say in conclusion, this is not something that I wanted to believe is true. Like, look, I, I, I would love there to be uh, aliens coming here from elsewhere who are different from us in fascinating ways. Like, I mean, if you think about the octopus and how different it is from us, right, even on our own planet, what we could learn from an encounter with minds that are structured so differently uh, would be absolutely fascinating to me as a philosopher. But unfortunately, most unfortunately and appallingly, I have to say uh, that I don't think that's what's going on here. Uh, there's something going on here involving time, the technological singularity, and totalitarian control of human society. That's really what this phenomenon is about. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, I do think it's a, that's, a, that's a very big portion of it. And, and that's, the, that's the, where your discernment needs to be really high. But there is like another element of, um, I don't know what, what your thoughts on like the fairy realm is. Absolutely. F fantastic. We should have a whole other conversation about that sometime. Yes, um, I do. Because that is a whole other subject because I, and, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's connected, right? Because if we're living in a computational cosmos, there is a cosmic intelligence at a higher reference level than ours. And I think these trickster type phenomena um, and these fairy type and el elven intelligences that were encountered by various people throughout history, um, they do represent a different layer of this phenomenon than the control system that we've been describing. Right. And there's a kind of, there's a, you could say dynamic tension, if not an antagonism between those two layers of the phenomenon. And that's a subject that I'm going to address by the end of the book that I'm writing. In fact, the last chapter of the book is going to be about that. Okay, perfect. Well, if you ever need some stories about that, like I, I, I have a lot of contact with that realm, which is very bizarre. And I did not want that to be true, but that's sort of something that's happened to me. So like- I'd love to hear about it. And I look forward to another conversation with you. Sounds great. All right, Jason, this was awesome. And uh, yeah, we'll talk soon. Thank you, Nikki. Have a great day. Ha, ha, ha.